My name is Matthew Rankin. I'm the director of a film called The 20th Century, which is playing in the legendary Berlinale Forum section. Canadians, do more than is your duty. Expect less than is your right. Daniel Byrne stars as William Lyon Mackenzie King, Canada's greatest politician. By New Winter's Day, I will be Prime Minister of Canada. May the best man win. It's the flaming saga of a hesitating young man's rendezvous with destiny and the woman whose love would sweep him to immortal heights. Come, give your mother a kiss. And a world torn between tenderness and fury, a world for which there is no escape from the 20th century. I happen to believe that politics is about building a better world. A better world? <laughs> there is no better world. Mr. King. Every minute of my life has been wasted. Like everything I've ever believed has been a monstrous lie. You are a puppet in a terrible game to destroy the future. I will have no choice but to formally charge you with crimes against national dignity. Please, Your Excellency, I'm begging you. I like it when you beg. Mother, give me strength. Make me equal to this moment. Canadian. Long have you smoldered in disappointment. The time has come to unleash your fury. Forgive me. Hi, and welcome to the 34th Teddy Award. My name is Jan Felix Wutig, and I'm here with director Matthew Rankin to talk about his film, The 20th Century. Hi, Matthew. Hi, Good thanks. to have you. Thank you, yes, <laughs> okay. happy to be here. Yeah. I think uh, your movie is one of these which has a very specific, very cool look about them. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many scenes that I enjoyed so much. Uh, there's specifically sort of uh, all these characters. Uh, like I said, um, there's this character of, of the uh, Kijan place. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Dr. Wakefield. Yes. And um, there's some incredible writing there, you know, when he kind of attaches, uh, w when he gives that kind of therapy and he attaches the machine mm -hmm. to the main character and, uh, and he kind of goes like, if this is not stopped, it will give rise to a, to a race of <laughs> feeble-minded, slump shoulders, weaklings, you know? <laughs> yes. Um, how did you... Language. Yeah. <laughs> how did you conceive that character? It's two things. One, I was really inspired by Ki Chan himself. He's an amazing actor. I met him at Sundance a few years ago, and I was just uh, immediately fascinated by him, and I just wanted to make a film with him. And I wrote that role with him in mind, specifically. Um, but the role was also researched. I was researching a lot of um, Victorian anti-masturbation anti propaganda from sort of the late 19th century, and um, I found all these really interesting quacks who had uh, devised all these bizarre methods of stopping people from masturbating. And, and a lot of his dialogue comes from um, sort of strict anti-masturbatory dictates that, <laughs> that I found in this literature. Um, and all of the machines that he uses to uh, stop the main character from masturbating, they all really did exist. Um, my favorite one is uh, what was called a cactus skin glove. And it was a glove. It wasn't actually made out of a cactus, but it was like a cactus. It was made of leather, and it, it had um, spikes on it. Um, so this is was really quite gothic. And, and, um, and he was also a little bit inspired by John Harvey Kellogg, who was an American uh, uh, breakfast cereal manufacturer. As you know, <laughs> Kellogg's Corn Flakes were in, initially intended as an anti-masturbation um, treatment. Yeah. The idea being that if you ate a very bland foodstuff, it would stop you from masturbating. I can assure you it does work. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> um, yeah, so the cactus hand I actually made it into the film as yeah, a sort a of like the, the tool of uh, Schultz. That's the, right. The, yeah, there's the, a little, yeah. uh, little cactus skin glove yeah. cameo. Yeah. That's right, yeah. <laughs> and so many of the places in the film are kind of portrayed or are told through these incredible sets that you use mm -hmm. for cities like Toronto and, and Winnipeg among others. Mm -hmm. um, could you tell me a little bit about how you constructed these sets or how, how they came about, how you conceived them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a few things. Um, 
part of it, I mean, it's a period piece. It takes place in 1899, and I, I sort of came to the conclusion very early on that if I was to try to aspire to some sort of Spielbergian gloss and make sort of a credible uh, period piece, uh, my budget would be uh, completely demolished within a few hours. So, so um, I, I tried to do just sort of the opposite, to kind of um, work in a tradition of the great masters of cinematic artifice and really just embrace the artificial nature of, of cinema and uh, make something a little bit more in a theatrical tradition. And that was also part of the, part of the historical conceit of the film. I really wanted the viewer to be constantly uh, confronted by the artificiality of what they're watching. Because the film is, uh, it sort of deals with um, a nation building project in Canada and I wanted, I wanted the, the falsity, the, the artificiality of nationhood and that uh, to be sort of a constant presence, constantly aware that we're grafting this, this structure upon, upon the natural world um, artificially. Yeah, and so that that's also kind of shows in, in earlier of you, uh, and earlier examples of your films, like uh, Minarski Death Plummet. Yeah. It kind of mm. goes, uh, also has that kind of, I don't know, like sort of throwback aesthetic to, to maybe like 20s to 40s kind of golden age of cinema mm -hmm. kind of styles. Yeah, it is a little bit like that. I think, I, I, again, what, what I re find really interesting is cinematic artifice. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that. Uh, in that era, there was a little bit. It was a little bit closer to theater. The cinema was a little bit closer to theater, and as a result, uh, artifice was was more welcome. I feel like now uh, it's quite the opposite. I feel like now we we typically repulse artifice. We try to make things look as real as possible, uh, but of course, reality can also. You know, reality is. Um, you know, it, it can be. Uh, it can be a terrible thing. Uh, and you know, there are biases in reality that uh, perhaps are not serving us well. So my thinking was, uh, yeah, I like to sort of explode these and um, and try to make an aesthetic virtue out of this fakery. Cool. And concerning the the main character, William Mackenzie King. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that, that's just from my sort of European perspective, but. Um, as I understand, he's he's in, in many parts of Canada still sort of very celebrated figure who led the country for a long period of years, mm -hmm. among which was also kind of the the intervention of, of uh, the Second World War. Yes. Um, could you maybe tell us what your idea was behind making him sort of the, the protagonist? Yeah. Well, I felt well. Um Yes, he was the Prime Minister for almost 22 years, longer than anyone else. Um, there are parks named after him. Uh, there's a bridge named after him. His face is on the $50 bill. Uh, so he is sort of part of the state edifice. But I don't know that he's necessarily celebrated. Um, I think that he will only really ever be celebrated wherever people celebrate the most compromised versions of themselves. Um, I think of him as a radical centrist and uh, someone whose political legacy is, is actually kind of an empty triumph, um, quite meaningless really. Um, but that, that was nonetheless very interesting to me. He was a person that was, uh, lived with a lot of contradiction and he had a, a very distinct private and public lives. He was a lifelong bachelor and he was really lonesome and, um, and he had an introspective expression that I found really interesting. Uh, and he was a compulsive diarist. Myself, I'm a, I've kept a diary for a very long time and uh, anyone who keeps a diary knows what a melodramatic document this is. And uh, Just reading Mackenzie King's diary as a young man, I was really struck by how uh, passive aggressive and um, uh, <laughs> smug and self-pitying and um, kind of petty. <laughs> um, it wasn't, it just reminded me so much of my own journal um, that I, I just felt an instant connection with yeah. him. Um, and and I, think, I think a lot of first features are about how the filmmaker has wasted their youth a little bit. Um, so in Mackenzie King's uh, youthful diary, I saw a lot of my own yeah, yeah. wasted youth. <laughs> yeah, I think there's quite a connection between diaries of, of, of certain people and the way that they are written. You know, yes. like in that sort of kind of self, I don't know, disemboweling way almost that you kind of repeat mm -hmm. what you have lived through 
during the during the day and just kind of put it into something else. In a way. Yeah, you're yeah. you're you're processing the chaos of the world mm. and trying to understand it. Yeah. And a lot of times you understand it in a very modeling way that if you look back upon you'll feel deeply ashamed about how you saw it. So it's very much a parallel consciousness. It's not, um, you know, I don't really think of it as a factual record. It's like being in the subconscious of someone, somebody's head. Yeah. yeah. Was there any account of, of boots sniffling in there? Yeah. <laughs> was, there was, was it well, sort of... Well, see, that's the thing. There's all this speculation about what... Mackenzie King was really up to because he was a person who had a very tortured relationship with his own desire. Mm. And he will speak about, oh, I've committed this horrific sin, but he can't really name what it is. And then he'll speak in this very ambiguous language. And then at a certain point, you sort of think, ah, oh, he's about to reveal it, but then he'll cross something out or oh, he'll okay. rip out a page. So he can't, even in this private space, he could not admit, um, he could not admit his own uh, erotic impulse. So historians and artists uh, have inevitably had to fill in the blanks. Mm -hmm. so, so I had to fill in the blanks with some of my own fantasia. Okay. <laughs> I guess. All right. Yeah. Um, and, and sort of talking about that fantasia maybe, um, <clears throat> there's this set of Winnipeg, which is basically sort of like a, it's called the, the, the flash pots of Winnipeg, I yeah. think. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of this, I don't know how to describe it, it's sort of this, this in a way, it's a kind of wasteland of, of sort of very dynamic, uh, very visceral sort of structures and, and mud and yeah. Um, was it was there any kind of like <laughs> was there any anything sort of relating to Winnipeg in that way or was it yes? Because for example, um, I think it's Vancouver that is shown in a very sort of green with a lot of like tree trunks. Sort yeah, of cut down trees. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, each place in Canada I tried to represent um, in a way such that it, it you know, what, what, what we fear most about uh, our, our own selves uh, is sort of what is manifest. Uh, British Columbia, Vancouver is a place that, you know, represents itself as a place that's very harmonious with nature. But in fact, that's not exactly true, right? So I wanted to represent that as a, as a clear cut, like it's just a destroyed, ruined forest. Um, and Winnipeg similarly tries to feel like, you know, sort of Winnipeg propaganda. Uh, it's always trying to present Winnipeg as this very normal place, but, but really there's something else under the surface that you'll never find in this official literature. Um, and the great metaphor for that is uh, there's this wonderful public park in Winnipeg called Garbage Hill. And it, it is in fact a hill um, that uh, uh, city councillors laid grass over top of it, but it was previously the town dump. Okay. It's like where all civilian refuse was, was uh, uh, contained. Uh, and it was transformed into a public park. And I, I really think of that as kind of the, that's a great metaphor for Winnipeg. It has this very, very constructed uh, epidermis, yeah. but underneath is just, just this just filth. <laughs> so uh, so I, I wanted to kind of use that as the metaphor. So, so Winnipeg is represented as, as this kind of intestinal, um, you know, coiling, yeah, troglodyte yeah, yeah. underworld uh, carved out of a rubbish heap. Okay. But I think, I think it's, you know, um, that's my contribution. All, all artists from Winnipeg are um, sort of competing against each other to try to make Winnipeg seem as strange as possible. Okay. Uh, and so, so this is, this is my, my little contribution. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's a very um, specific uh, look to the film in a sense as well that um, many of the characters um, are kind of uh, male actors portraying female characters or vice versa. Mm -hmm. Among them also, also uh, Louis Negan, yeah, yeah. Which, which is just great in his role as, 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 as the mother. Yes. Um, could you maybe talk a little bit about how important that was to you to give kind of, a, I guess you could call it sort of also a queer look to the film in mm -hmm. that sense. Yeah. Yeah, I really wanted to. Um, yeah, I really wanted to sort of take a school play approach to casting in a way. Um, my acting career ended decades ago, but uh, the first time I ever acted in a play was uh, I played Martha Cratchit in a school production of A Christmas Carol, and really, uh, sort of non-binary casting is completely normal in a school play. And, and, and in theater writ large, um, it's, just, it's completely normal. The, the demographic profile of the actor is not really that important. And, and, um, 
And I find that very liberating and very exciting. And for some bizarre reason, we don't do that so much in, in cinema. And I think that's, that reveals something about the, the bias of how we understand realism. And I think maybe there's a problem in there. Um, so I really wanted to just really, my casting was very, very broad and I just wanted to cast the right person for the role. And, and I did audition quite broadly, all genders, all gender expressions. And uh, really it came down to, to sort of matching the spirit of the person with the role, rather sort of transcending gender, you know? Um, and I find that's really exciting. I feel it, it creates also a, a kind of uh, exciting, um, ambiguous space which is beyond which is beyond constructs beyond binary construct and that's sort of part of what the film is trying to undermine you know it, it is a little bit about a nation building project right and and nations much like genders are, are um, you know their their identities that we construct and, and perform right so um, so yeah the, the 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 sort of animating spirit the the heart beating within the chest of this film is very one that is very much one that's trying to sort of uh, undo the, yeah. the the tyranny of those structures. Deconstruct in yeah. a way, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and concerning that, there's sort of uh, sort of fighting ideologies within the film, mm -hmm. whereas uh, sort of the disappointment, yeah. and there's the imperial fury, and there's sort of la tendresse, the, yeah. the sort of the tenderness of love mm -hmm. that comes seems to come from uh, um, from uh, Tart. Yeah. Uh, and Quebec City, mm -hmm. um, and it sort of seems to be that in the end run, there's kind of uh, a decision being made between uh, sort of fury and tendresse, mm -hmm. uh, which goes on to much like more disappointment. Actually, yeah. was there was there an <laughs> idea behind like? What was your idea behind sort of the... Well, that, yeah, that is, that, that, is, that is my monument to Mackenzie King's yeah. life. Uh, <laughs> it is really that. And to Canada itself, the nation he would ultimately lead. Um, I think that, you know, I don't really think of it as a, an activist film, but um, it's definitely concerned with sort of questions of political leadership. I feel like, you know, there... And it does sort of play with three forms. There's this one form of leadership where we we are trying to appeal to the very best in people and making our political energy out of the very best expression, the, you know, the fundamental goodness of humanity, right? So that is the idea of the tendresse. The idea of the fury is the opposite of that, of course. The idea that there's another way to lead by provoking the very worst expression in people, right? And that's the easiest way to lead, actually. And Mackenzie King was a person in history who walked a very fine line between both of these. Uh, and he represents the center. And it's something that I find, you know, I find myself more and more preoccupied by is that I feel like, I feel like the, the ideological elastic uh, in the world at this moment is stretching to, the, to its snapping point. And it, it concerns me. And I, I, it makes me think about the evaporation of the center and what the center really means, you know. Um, and uh, I'm not a person who votes at the center and I don't, you know, um, this is not something I identify with, but it's something that I think about is, you know, the, 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 you know, generously we might think of the center as a space of democracy, that, you know, the idea that there's many legitimate options in a democratic society and that the center represents a willingness to listen to other people, right? That would yeah. be the generous view. But there's another way we could look at the center as something much more opportunistic and perhaps even a little bit sinister. It's a way of hiding. Yeah. It's a yeah. way of protecting one's power. It's a way of perhaps empowering uh, quite the opposite of what you're publicly defending, you know? Um, so I feel like that all of those things are sort of at work in the Mackenzie King legacy, and it's something that you can trace throughout Canadian history, and I think it's something that you see, you know, and it, it's a, it's, it's a, um, it's a, something I'm preoccupied in in the world as well. Yeah, and I found there was a lot of very insightful aspects to that. You know, in the, in the way that passive aggressiveness is sort of yeah. celebrated also yeah. in, the, in the kind of contests that the uh, the candidates have to go through. Yeah, and there's this you know this this kind of greeting where do more than is your duty, expect less than is your right. <laughs> yeah. It's very cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just, it's all about empty triumph. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a poem about Mackenzie King that someone wrote, and it's something very pertinent, again, for the world. Uh, the poet wrote, Frank Scott is his name, he wrote, um, let us raise up a temple to the cult of mediocrity. Do nothing by halves that can be done by quarters. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's wow. a little bit like okay. that sort of... Uh, <laughs> 
sort of the, the tuning fork. <laughs> yeah. Breaking it kind of down, yeah, that's yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, I think that's it for me. Oh, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you, thank Where you very much. Thank you so much for, for being here. Ah, yeah. It's, it's okay. my great pleasure. Thank you. All right, yeah, yeah. cool.